I won't forget that morning, not if I live to be a hundred. I counted the men as they marched out of the yard. They'd hardly slept for weeks. We of the CID had slept even less, but the nightmare that kept us awake was all the same nightmare. That's why we weren't surprised when the commissioner asked us up to the conference room for a bit of a talk. He'd talk to us plenty, we knew that. It didn't help any to know what was ahead of us. Must we have that window open, Gregson? Oh, shut it if you want to. Chief will be in enough of a temper without having a ruddy blast down the back of his neck. Gentlemen, the commissioner. Stuffy in here. Be seated, won't you? Gentlemen, if you wish to know what able men you are, read any of the works of popular fiction that glamorize your achievements, but don't, I beg of you, read the daily papers. They might give you an inferiority complex. I hate to mention it, but we are confronted with a series of the most atrocious murders since Jack the Ripper. And in the meantime, the CID might as well be playing at shove hate me for all the good we've accomplished. Now look. Here, here, and here. Each of these red flags scattered through the city stands for a woman brutally murdered, a woman's terror, a woman's death agony. These are no ordinary crimes. These are the works of a fiend who kills first and mutilates afterwards. A ghoul who hacks off a part of his victim body and carries it away with him. A loathsome souvenir of his butchery. Three women murdered so far, and you haven't turned in one clue. You haven't given me one lead. Here you sit and wait for news of a fourth victim with your arms folded. Well, we hadn't long to wait. It was down Lambeth Way where a young woman was hurrying home late last night. She saw something and stopped. It was a constable. He spoke to her and he walked along with her, just in case. He saw her go down the stairway to the basement lodging where she lived. We can only surmise what happened after that. Well, I put my pride in my pocket and went to see the man who had so often helped out Inspector Lestrade and myself in the past. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. If ever a man needed help, I did. This makes four, Inspector. Four defenseless women here in the heart of London. And everyone with the right forefinger hacked off. Not hacked, Inspector Gregson. Cleanly, expertly severed. The work of a skilled surgeon. That's our only clue. Much about the age of my sister's girl. Is there no way of stopping this, Mr. Holmes? Yes. There's a way, somehow. The fiend that did this. I promise. I promise. We have nothing to go on. That's the rotten part of it. We can't get far without knowing the motive. Or at least we know what the motives were not. It wasn't robbery, nor passion, thanks be, nor yet vengeance because they all came of totally unrelated families. Steady, Inspector, steady. Sorry, Mr. Holmes. I don't turn a hair when it's a bloke that can look after himself. A little slip of a thing like that. Yes, it's horrible. Come on, let's get a drink.
Good evening, Mr. Holmes. Good evening, Vincent. Miss Kinsoda, please, and a double for my friend here, Inspector Gregson. Thank you, sir. Thank you, my Irish. Please, nobody to give me a hand with this thing, Mr. Holmes. Always a pleasure to be of help to Scotland Yard, Inspector. A little out of my line, looking for a maniac who murders just for the fun of it. <laughs> or perhaps just to get a human finger. In all four cases, murderer risk capture and stopping to secure a finger. Well, what for? Who knows? He's just a madman. Perhaps there's method in his madness. If we could just trace those missing fingers. If? If we could just drain the English Channel, we might find a penny. Eh? Huh. Oh, thank you. Let me keep those, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Hmm. Sir George Fenwick, isn't it? Yes. That is daughter with him. Don't be so naive, Inspector. You know everyone, don't you, darling? Well, hardly. A week ago, I didn't know you. A week? How fast it's gone. I collect these things. How very quaint of you. Shall we go? Yes. What are you looking at, Mr. Holmes? Looking at a very handsome woman. Not to want the purple, but uh, giving an excellent imitation. Would you like to come to my flat for a nightcap? Lovely idea. Yes, isn't it? I wonder where she's taking Sir George Fenwick. Don't be so naive, Mr. Holmes. Good evening, Mum. Hello, Grandon. Any messages? No, Mum. Thank you. Uh, drinks, Grandon. One of your nice surprises. Yes, Mum. I say, you don't mean that... Uh... Grandon's a marvel, aren't you, Grandon? Yes, Mum. You wouldn't believe the things she can do. Hmm. Ah, charming place. Delightful. Really? Do you think so? I'm so glad. Do sit down. Do you mind? Do I mind? What a question. I don't mind anything, really. Except not being with you. Now, you really don't want me to believe that, do you? Not too seriously. Good. We're both quite grown up, aren't we? Quite. You're a treasure, Crandon. And lower the lights a little as you leave. I prefer a more flattering light. <laughs> In any light you'd be... Would I? And don't you know it? <laughs> Perhaps I do. Oh, that priceless woman. You wouldn't believe it, but she's absurdly romantic. She loves dreamy music, and she thinks that we... But uh, we do, don't we? Do we? Well, it's rather soothing, restful. Yes. And we all need rest at times. 
like tired children who've played too long. You've played with wooden soldiers, I suppose. Hmm. Funny. Hadn't thought of that for years. Toy boats were my special joy. Anything I could set afloat anywhere. Like this. And this. Toy boats sailing into the Never Never Land. The land of beautiful dreams. Look. Look, odd, isn't it, how the light is reflected? Little specks of light that move and move, like stars on a slowly moving stream. You know, Holmes, I'm very sensitive to atmosphere. No. Yes, I can tell by the feel of this room there's been a murder committed here. It may interest you to know, my dear fellow, it was the other side of that door at the foot of the stairs that the poor girl was murdered. If only I could find it. Find what? The one thing these unfortunate victims have in common that might give us a motive for these murders. There must be something. Another Jack the Ripper, if you ask me, a homicidal maniac. No, Watson, in the case of Jack the Ripper, there was one thing in common. His victims were all from one walk of life, living in the same section of the city. In this case, the murderer chooses his victims from all walks of life and from different sections of the city. No, my dear fellow, this is not the work of a homicidal maniac. It's something infinitely more sinister. You mean the creeps? What on earth are you talking about? Watson, I'm convinced that these murders are only incidental to some larger and more diabolical scheme. That may be, but why the severed fingers? The answer to that question, my dear fellow, is our only hope of solving these mysteries. Dear sister, I am so happy. I had such a lovely holiday at Brighton with you and Alf. And I'm looking forward to being with you again. Poor little thing. Sort of raises a lump in your throat. I can picture her sitting here happily writing this letter. And I'm not bit realizing that she's shortly going to her death. Hello? Gregson? Oh, there you are, Mr. Holmes. I've been looking for you everywhere. What's happened? Murder in Edgeway Road, not half an hour ago. Woman? Yes. On the right forefinger, cut off clean. Fancy, Mum. There's been another of those horrible murders. Dear, dear, how shocking. Yes, Mum. I really don't feel quite safe here myself. Oh, dear. Why, Sir George? I must see Miss Marlowe at once. I, I don't know I, if she... I must see her. Where is she? Lydia. Why, Sir George, what is it? What happened? I don't know. You'll have to help me. You've got to help me. But I don't understand. Listen, I woke up a few minutes ago in a cheap boarding house off Edgware Road. I don't know how I came there. I don't know when. The last thing I remember is being here with you. Calm yourself, Sir George. When did I leave here? Well, it was about... Uh... 
It was 10.45, Mum. Precisely. You seemed, uh, forgive me, just a little distressed. Detached, not interested. I thought I'd said something to offend you. I don't remember. I can't remember. Tell me, has this happened to you before? Before? Well, there is such a thing as amnesia, you know. If it was 10.45 when I left you, it was 9 this morning when I woke. Over 10 hours lost. 10 hours that I can't account for. And in my pocket when I woke, I found... Yeah, in my pocket. That isn't... Oh, it's not for you, of course. It can't be. Excuse me, Mum, but there's a man asking to see the gentleman. Send him away. Yes, Mum. No, 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 please. I'll see him. Well? Delightful room. Not much like the place you woke up in this morning. You followed me here? Yes. Are you uh, a detective? Oh, no. Quite the contrary. Don't be afraid, Sir George. You know my name? Oh, yes. A very old and highly honored name. And being the bearer of such a name, and also a very wealthy man, I thought you might care to possess yourself of this trifle rather than let it fall into the hands of the police. It is yours, if I'm not mistaken. The initials, GF. Where did you get this? It came out of your pocket. I saw it fall, but you never noticed. You were very busy bending over something with a knife. Then you put something in your pocket. Come along, Holmes, come along, come along. How many more talismans, I tell you? You're missing a treat. This is delicious. Little jam tarts to follow. Aren't you tempted? Mm. You and your flesh pots. They tell me that. Uh, Fish is good for the brains. Brains? I haven't any. You realize that a day, a whole day, and a night have gone by since that bestial affair in Edgware Road? I'm as much in the dark as ever. Hello, here comes a client, unless I'm very much mistaken. Very attractive. Obviously, she left home under the stress of some very great emotion. How do you know that? She isn't wearing any gloves. A startling omission in a young lady of fashion. No, she didn't put her coat on. Open car, too. Furthermore, there's something in that bag she wants to show me. What makes you say that? The bag doesn't match her dress, indicating it was. Pick for size rather than style, to accommodate some bulky object. You amaze me, Holmes. What do you mention, my dear fellow? Well, that's interesting. What is? A cab, turning at the empty house. I wonder why he followed her here. Oh, wouldn't you? I possibly do without it. So now, yes, Mrs. Hudson? It's a young lady, sir, most urgent. Ask her to come in. Oh, 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 go right in, miss. 
Mr. Holmes? Yes, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Holmes, I... You must excuse me, please, I... Yes, well, won't you sit down? Uh, come along. May I? Oh. It's quite all right. Thank you. Now, try to control yourself, Miss Fennick. You're with friends. You know my name? No magic, I assure you. I've often seen your picture. You're the daughter of Sir George Fennick, aren't you? Yes. It's about my father that I... What about your father, Miss Fennick? Oh, I don't know what to do. He's always been the nicest, dearest person. Only since Mother died. Yes, yes, but uh, we, we know. So I didn't think anything of it when he was away all night before last. But he didn't come home until yesterday at tea time. Didn't come in for dinner at all. Just paced up and down in the library hour after hour. I begged him to let me in, but he wouldn't. Steady, steady. Now take your time. I couldn't sleep a wink last night. Then I started hearing things. Hearing things? What sort of things? I heard someone in the garden underneath my window. Then I saw a figure moving down the garden path. And I recognized my father. Stealing through his own garden like a thief. He had a spade in his hand. And he stopped by the greenhouse where he started to dig. This morning, at daybreak, I, I stole out into the garden and... I found this. A finger. A human finger. Bring up Scotland Yard, Willie Watson. Ask them to get hold of Inspector Gregson and tell him to meet us at once at George Finnick's house, Kingston. Operator, get me Scotland Yard quick. Where's my father, Norris? He's still in the library, miss. Thank you. We'll see him right away. Will you come with me, please? Thank you. I got your message, Mr. Holmes. Yes, indeed. Dad, may I come in? Dad. That's funny. He doesn't answer. You mind? Please do. Thank you. Watson, quick. Oh. Come along, no, my dear. No, no, no. Take charge, Miss Fennick, please. Fennick, sir. Now, please, please. Uh, please. Come along with me. Dead? Yes. What do you make of it, Doctor? Shot in the back, between the second and third ribs. The bullet undoubtedly penetrated the heart. Look at the powder marks on his coat. I was afraid of this. What do you mean? Don't you remember the man in the cab who followed Miss Fennick to Baker Street? Well, you don't think he had anything to do with it, do you? I think it's reasonable to assume that he tipped off someone that I'd been sent for. Sir George has obviously been murdered to keep him from telling me what he knew. What was the weapon used? Small caliber revolver, point blank range by the look of the wound. <laughs> the murderer came in through those French windows. The mud from the garden he brought in on his boots. Sir George must have surprised the intruder. Pass the room to him here. Hmm. What follows, we can't tell. But from the location of the wound, I'd say that he turned his back for a moment, and as he turned, the muzzle of the revolver was placed between his ribs and one muffled shot fired. Then you mean to say he kept on going, even after he was shot? There's no doubt about it. Look there. The trail of blood leads us back to the desk. There's something Sir George was after. Something. I know. He was trying to summon help, poor chap. I don't think so, Watson. There's the bell pulled by the fireplace. No, you'll notice from the trail of blood that Sir George made straight for this desk here. I wonder if there was something he was desperately anxious to get. Hello. His right hand's clenched. That's perfectly natural. Death agony. But the left hand lies open. Why only one hand clenched in the death agony, the... The right hand, the hand nearest the desk. Please note that. If Sir George took something off this desk, something so important that he spilled his last drop of blood to get it, I want to know what it is. <laughs> it's 
Nothing but an ordinary match folder. Where does that lead us? I imagine to something very important, Gregson. This match folder's from Pembroke House. Why shouldn't it be? He was there, you know. We saw him yesterday. Yes, but the effort he made after he was shot to get hold of this match folder. It's just possible he wanted someone to remember Pembroke House. He may have wished to recall it to someone who saw him there. Someone who, like ourselves, saw him with a woman. Come in. Oh, Dr. Watson, this came by hand for Mr. Holmes not ten minutes ago. Thank you, Mrs. Elson. That would be the report from Mr. George's bank. Report from Mr. George? Oh, really? Don't you remember his daughter told us that he just closed his account? Had it looked into at once. Hmm. He drew out his balance in cash, nearly 10,000 pounds, yesterday, just after that young woman was murdered. What does that suggest to you, Watson? That he paid it out to someone. Precisely. I smell the faint, sweet odor of blackmail. You don't think he paid it out to someone who saw him murder the McLean woman? Sir George never murdered anyone. But he did have that woman's finger, and he empty did have a lot of, and pay out a lot of cash. That's the terrifying part about blackmail, Watson. The victim is afraid to fight the accusation, no matter how false. Once the accusation is made, his name is smeared, and sometimes his life is ruined. Well, Sir George didn't commit these murders. What fiend did? I rather think they're not the work of any one man. Oh, come, Holmes. You don't expect me to believe there's a whole organization going about killing people and, and chopping off their fingers. No, it's possible, quite possible. Well, whoever's behind all this thing must be out of his mind. On the contrary, my dear fellow. If my assumptions are correct, this little scheme has behind it the most brilliant and ruthless intellect the world has ever known. You don't mean Professor Moriarty? I do. Oh, steady, Holmes, you've got him on the brain. This is the third time in as many months you've suspected him of unsolved crimes. He's dead, you know. Is he? Is he? You know he is. He was hanged in Montevideo well, over a year ago. I know that someone was hanged in Montevideo under that name. But I'll stake my reputation that Moriarty is alive and here. Now, in London. Hello? Yes, but Dr. Watson, wait a minute. You me? Hello, yes? This is Dr. Watson speaking. No, no, I'm afraid I've retired. I don't practice anymore. What? Oh, that's a, that's a different thing. An emergency case. Well, just a minute. Yes? Yes, well, see, she's not moved. Remember that. Don't touch it till I get there. Fractured kiss in, in the Carlos Muse. Heavy woman. Fourteen stone. Oh. Look at it. Dust. <coughs> Fourteen stone. Oh. Just the sort of person who would hoist herself up on a stool to feed the canary. There ought to be a law against fat people keeping little dicky birds. Well. So long, old man. I shan't be very long. I haven't used that bag since I brought little Amelia What's her name in the world. She grew up to be a very unattractive child. Well, who wouldn't with a name like Amelia? Oh, Amelia. Amelia. <laughs> 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 Stupid about access.
Oh, Professor Moriarty. Not that I wish to appear inquisitive, but to what am I indebted for the pleasure of this visit? Scotland Yard will be interested. It's very convenient for me to have Scotland Yard think that I'm still dead in Montevideo. I never dreamed of fooling you. Thank you. The thought occurs to me, Mr. Holmes, that there are some advantages in living within the law. They are very comfortably fixed here, aren't you? As I get on in life, the little comforts appeal to me more and more. Oh, why would we go, pardon? Won't you sit down? Thank you. And now, Professor Moriarty, what can I do for you? Everything that I have to say to you has already crossed your mind. And my answer has no doubt crossed yours. That's final. What do you think? I shall not rest until you are hanged for the finger murders. You have no proof, you know. No, not a shred. But I have you. I could turn you over to the police here and now. You could. But if you did, you'd never see Dr. Watson again. Oh, the telephone call. Quite. I rather assumed you had taken some such precaution. Or I should have snatched up a revolver and indulged in a fit of heroics when you came in. Very smart, aren't you? Not smart enough. Or I should have anticipated you. But if any harm comes to Dr. Watson, I shall seek you out. I shall not rest until I find you, and when I do... No harm will come to Dr. Watson this time. But I can't answer for the future. Mr. Holmes, I should strongly advise you to drop this case. Don't be silly. Think it over. We've had many encounters in the past. You hope to place me on the gallows. I tell you, I shall never stand up on the gallows. But if you are instrumental in any way in bringing about my destruction, you will not be alive to enjoy your satisfaction. And we shall walk together through the gates of eternity, hand in hand. What a charming picture that would make. Yes, wouldn't it? Now, I really think it might be worth it. Shoelaces, Governor? Tons a pair. And strong enough to hang yourself. How many more times since I tell you I don't want your filthy shoelaces or your company? Shoelaces, Governor? Nasty impertinence. Run along, my good man, or I'll give you in charge. Shoelaces, Governor. Shoelaces, Governor. You're oh, a poor bloke. <laughs> What's only got one arm? Any luck with Mr. Holmes? You can read his obituary in tomorrow's papers. Come in. I was um, just going out to look for you. Look for me? What for? Suppose you don't think I know my way about. Well, you're right, I don't. Blast all practical jokers, anyhow. Know where I've been? On a wild goose chase. Exactly. There's no such number in McArdle's muse. Some fool's idea of a joke. Did you, uh, did you see anyone? No, nobody especially. Only a whining old idiot selling bootlaces. Persistent beggar, wasn't he? Stuck to you like grim death. Huh? How do you know? And finally I left you for someone who looked like Bella Pickings. Someone, my dear Watson, was Professor Moriarty himself. What? He's just called on me. Moriarty here and you let him go? But you must be out of your mind. Why? Well, he bluffed me into believing that he was holding a friend of mine as hostage. Friend of yours who? Oh, nobody very important. Just a fat, lazy fellow. Medical man, I believe. Medical man? Do I know him? Uh, yes, I think you do. Uh, fellow by the name of Watson. Watson? Watson? Never heard... Who? Me? I'm afraid so, old fellow. Your street hawker's job was to do away with you in a certain contingency. And you let Moriarty go because of me? I had no choice. I can't afford to lose you, old fellow. Well, it's very decent of the old chap, I must say, but... Uh, well, uh, I wish you'd nabbed him. We shall, never fear. I know the motive for the finger murders. All I have to find out now is the method used with the blackmail victims. Method? Yes. How does Moriarty get them to the scene of the crime? 
How does he plant those severed fingers on them? And how does he scare them into believing that, uh, they may have committed those atrocious murders themselves? Curious. Very curious. Huh? Curious? What's curious? That window in the empty house across the street. First floor front. Huh? What's wrong with it? It's open. <laughs> well, shouldn't it be open? Well, it wasn't open half an hour ago. I'll stake my life on that. Oh, well, that's not our business. Let it stay open. <laughs> I, uh, wonder if you'd go over, old fellow, and see what's the matter. Oh, trespassing. It's against the law. Mm, very well, I'll go myself. Oh, well, if you're going to put it like that, Ridiculous waste of time going about shutting windows at this hour of the night. Yeah, you better take this torch. Well, take what? <laughs> Dignified job for a doctor. Dr. Watson, the torchbearer. And what do you propose to do? Sit in a comfortable chair, I suppose, and read a good book. That's a very good idea. Yeah, it's a very good idea. While I play night watchman, you have a nice read. Mm -hmm. Good night. Have a good time. Have a good time. What do you mean, have a good time? thing to keep about the house. <laughs> Must have been a pet. <laughs> <laughs> It's comfortably reading a book. a second ago. Not me, my dear fellow. Merely the bust of Julius Caesar. Incidentally, you may have noticed that uh, all through the ages, prominent men have prominent noses. Oh, I'm afraid we're in for terrible trouble again with Mrs. Hudson. Windows smashed, plaster all over the floor. Get up, you. Corporal Williams, Middlesex Regiment. Discharged from the army is physically unfit. Yeah. Papers seem in order. Now, Corporal Williams, you've seen service in the Far East, haven't you? The East? I thought so. Look at his complexion, Watson. Yellow as saffron. He's been taking atabrine. Cure for malaria. Sniper, aren't you? Sniper? Hmm. Why did you try to kill me? I had to kill him. I had to. Oh, snap out of it. Stop it, Watson. He's shamming. No, he isn't. Who told you to kill me? She told me. She told you? She told me I couldn't miss. Well, luckily you did miss, you murderer. He isn't a murderer, Watson. Listen, Corporal Williams. 
She told you you had to do it, didn't she? I had to do it. I've got it, Watson, I've got it. Got what? The method used in the finger murders. Well, what is it? Hypnotism, my dear fellow, hypnotism. And it wasn't against his nature, that's the devilish part of it. They picked a man for that purpose whose job was sniping. Who are they? Professor Moriarty and his finger murderers. William spoke of a woman. I think you'll find that she asked him home tonight for a drink. Nice quiet rooms, soft lights, music. You got it all pat, Mr. Holmes. What's the lady look like? Oh, uh, up 30, nice figure, blonde, lustrous eyes. Oh, really? Got a phone number? Oh, so? Williams will give us her address. Look after him, Gregson. Don't let anyone come near him. He's our key witness in the finger murders. Well, I hope you're guessing right, Mr. Holmes. Get up, Williams. Now, go with Inspector Gregson anywhere he tells you. Come on. Yeah. Ring me as soon as he comes to himself, will you? I will. Good night, gentlemen. Good night. Well, if you believe that fellow Williams was hypnotized, I suppose you think Sir George Fenwick was hypnotized too. Yes, I'm quite sure of it. Have a cup of tea? Thanks, old boy. Nothing to eat. But why didn't these people make Sir George do the murder himself? Because they didn't want to get him hanged. They, uh... They wanted to blackmail him. Well, who do you think the actual murderer is? One of Moriarty's gang. A diabolically simple technique. Kill a woman. Yes, yes, yes. But, but why cut off the fingers? My dear fellow, don't you understand? The severed finger is what links the blackmail victim to the murder. He wakes. He finds the grisly thing in his pocket. He doesn't know how he got there. He's no idea that he's been hypnotized. For all he knows, he may have committed the atrocious crime during some dreadful lapse of sanity. In that state, when he's utterly demoralized, the blackmailers take over, is that it? Undoubtedly. You see, they swear that they saw him commit the murder. And being human, the victim will pay anything rather than stand trial on a charge that will make his very name loathsome. Oh, it all fits in if you believe in hypnotism. The only possible explanation. You think the hypnotist is that uh, woman with the blonde hair and the lustrous eyes, the, <laughs> the woman you invented? I didn't invent her. I saw her. What are you talking about? That woman, my dear Watson, was with Sir George when he left Pembroke House. I saw her there. I shall see her again, and Williams will lead me to her. That's why it's so important to keep him safe. He will identify her. Hello? Yes? Inspector Gregson? What? Well, get every constable in the district. Yes, I'll be over at once. What's happened, Holmes? Williams is missing. Great Scott! Come on. Lorry crashed into Gregson's car. During the confusion, Williams disappeared. Escaped, eh? No, kidnapped. To keep him from talking when he came to. You don't think that Moriarty... Moriarty? Anything is possible. Williams! Dead. You see? Anything is possible. Good morning, Professor Moriarty. You startled me. I'm dressing another dolly, a dear little nurse. Is there anything wrong with your finger? Just a splinter. Nasty thing, splinters. Most trying. One can't be too careful. But I'll get it out for you. I have the very instrument to help you. Sharp enough to split a hair. Put those tools away until they're needed. But they're not tools, sir. They're instruments. Put them away. Is Lydia in? Yes. But really, you should let me... Get dressed. 
Holmes and Watson just left Baker Street for the Mesmer Club. Mesmer Club? The meeting place of all the top hypnotists in London. Do you suppose that Mr. Holmes is on to our method? If he suspects, it's merely a suspicion. It's our business to see that it ends there. I hope you're right. William has passed away before he could talk, remember? What do you want me to do? Go to the Mesmer Club, meet Holmes, and induce him to come back here. Isn't that a bit dangerous? Every meeting with Sherlock Holmes is potentially dangerous. However, you say he didn't see your face at Pembroke House. And how would you suggest I get Mr. Holmes to accompany me here? Kidnap him? Oh, no. Holmes has one weakness, his insatiable curiosity. If you can arouse that, you can lead him anywhere. It's up to you to take advantage of any opportunity that may arise. Yeah. This way, please, gentlemen. I'll tell Dr. Ronslow that you're here. Thank you. And this is the Mesmer Club. If you ask me, hypnotism is a lot of mumbo-jumbo. Oh, come now, Watson. As a medical man, you must admit that hypnotism has its place in modern science. That may be, but 90% of hypnotists are crooks of the worst kind. Nothing more than a lot of charlatans exploiting weak-willed morons. Ah, Dr. Onslow, I believe. Uh, happy to meet you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, your brother Mycroft suggested I might be of help to you. Uh, he's a valued member of our little group of uh, charlatans and crooks. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. I didn't know you were listening. <laughs> Behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. My friend, Dr. Watson. Ah, oh, delighted. Oh, do you know? I wonder now. You see, we're in the midst of a little experimental session at this very moment, if you'd uh, care to join us. Oh, certainly, certainly. I'd be very instructive. Oh, well, will you follow me? Thank you. In treating his patients. But today, the therapeutic value of hypnotism, as we now call it, is conceded by innumerable physicians. Especially is it of value in surgical cases where the administration of local or of general anesthetic is inadvisable. Inadvisable poppycock. <laughs> For the sake of latecomers, I may say that I have placed this subject under profound hypnosis. In this condition, he can feel no pain, even under applications which normally would be excruciating. Excruciating? <laughs> Excuse me, please. Carter, you are having a peaceful sleep. You feel nothing. Your arms and your hands are without sensation. Mowbray, the long needle. Carter, give me your right hand. As you observe, the needle has been thrust completely through the subject's hand. No feeling, no pain. This lack of feeling is the one infallible test of profound hypnosis. Nonsense. Fellow's full of drugs. Well, isn't he? Definitely not, Doctor. Wake up, Carter, wake up. You feel well and rested, remember? No pain anywhere. Wake up, wake up. I say, when are you going to begin? All through, Carter. Stand up. This way, sir. And, uh, are these all the people that come here? Oh, no, no, no. Others keep dropping in all the time. I suppose it's all right for those who believe in it, but, of course, I'm a professional man myself. Then you don't believe in hypnotism, Dr. Watson. Oh, I don't deny that there are certain types of hysterical, feeble-minded people who go under if you point your finger at them. But anyone with, a, with an ounce of character... <laughs> <laughs> How right you are. You see right through our little artifices, don't you, Dr. Right through, my dear sir. Right through. Right so. But with the feeble-minded, as you say... Uh, excuse us, Mr. Oh, Holmes. Oh, certainly. Uh, step over here, won't you? Certainly, sir. Anything to oblige. <laughs> Let me show you how easily we charlatans uh, take advantage of them. Now, sit down, Doctor. <laughs> now, we set a thing like this in motion. It's wonderful, the attraction on the feeble-minded, of course. The continuous motion, if they just let themselves follow it. Of course, you could stare at it till Doon's Day, Dr. Watson, with no effect at all. 
still, it might make you a little drowsy, like the white ribbon of road at night when you're driving. The rhythm is smooth, unbroken, and the road goes on and on, round and round, always the same, winding and winding. And you're drowsy, you're tired. Let the road come into you as it were. The long road, the smooth road, the road to sleep, sleep. Open your eyes. Stand up. Turn around. And now, Dr. Watson, you're on a holiday in Scotland. The country is amazingly beautiful. We're coming to a stream. It isn't deep. Better take your shoes and socks off. up your trouser. Uh, that will do. The other leg is waterproof. Turn around. Mind the pedals. Sit down. Wake up now. Yeah, I see. What did I tell you? It didn't work with me. Why, nobody with an ounce of carry. Hmm? Hmm? I think you'll need these. Going to laugh at? Watson, she's here. Oh, a woman you're looking for? Yes, I'm going to meet her. Perhaps I can induce her to take me to Moriarty. Do you think it's wise, Holmes? It may not be wise, but it's essential. After all, I've held me on with Moriarty in the past. But isn't it dangerous? She might be a hypnotist. If my will isn't stronger than hers, I deserve to be hypnotized. Shh. I feel I must protest, Dr. Onslow. I was told this was a gathering of serious students of a great science. And I find myself in a company of buffoons. Oh, my dear man. Elliot and Esdale Braid. Were those men martyrs for the truth? That you may laugh over your childish, cruel tricks. I must say I'm in complete agreement with you, madam. This was the most unnecessary performance, Dr. Onslow. Beg your pardon, sir. My name is Holmes, Sherlock Holmes. At your service, madam. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Holmes. I'm afraid I've created a rather embarrassing situation. But you see, I'm interested in the serious study of hypnotism. So am I, too. Perhaps we have something in common, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps we have. Do you join me for a cocktail at Pembroke House? I don't. Good. Thank you. I didn't know there was such a pleasant place in London. It was so nice of you to suggest our coming here. I thought a little pick-me-up would do us good. You mean you thought I looked... Uh... I like the way you look. Thank you. I suppose I did lose my head a little at the Mesmer Club. But you see, hypnotism is almost a religion with me. I know so well what it can do to help and heal. And I can't bear to see it used for trivial purposes. I know very little about it. That's why I went to the Mesmer Club. You see, I'm rather puzzled just now with the case that I'm working on. How fascinating. Tell me about it. It's the murder of Sir George Fenwick. Fenwick? Who is he? Quite a well-known figure. Odd now I come to think of it. The last time I saw Sir George was here at Pembroke House. Strange. Yes, isn't it? He was sitting... Um, I believe you were sitting at this very table. Cigarette? Thanks. Do go on. There was a charming lady with him. He was, uh... He was lighting a cigarette. Charming. Did you see her face? No worse, like. Merely her back. 
How unenterprising of you. Yes, wasn't it? Afraid I'm getting a little older. I shouldn't say so. That's nice of you. Still, the first time in my life I've got hold of a case that's beyond me. I'm actually losing sleep over it. You know, Mr. Holmes, I believe I could help you. Really? I should be very grateful. You're amused. Oh, merely skeptical. How would you go about it? I've used hypnotism more than once in healing. Not for profit. I'm not a professional. But I do think I could help you. If you care to... I can't think of a pleasanter experience. Low lights, music, is that all there is to it? You must relax, Mr. Holmes. I'm afraid you're a rather difficult subject. So I thought perhaps a little help. Materia Medica might be advisable. Drugs? No, I'd rather not if you don't mind. As a matter of fact, I'd rather not myself. But shrink notzing he practiced in Munich, you know. Believed it the best means for difficult subjects. Do you mind? Well, as a matter of fact, I don't approve of sedatives. Just as you wish. We don't have to go on with this at all, you know. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. All right. I'll take a chance. It's really quite harmless. What is it? Cannabis japonica, an oriental soporific. You need water. yourself growing drowsy. Don't fight it. Give in to it. Because you do want to sleep, you know. Just fix your eyes on this one white flower floating on the water. Empty your mind of every other thought. Follow the motion of the water. So smooth. Not a ripple. Waters of forgetfulness. Steady. Deep. Strong. Strange, isn't it? How the light is reflected. Little specks of light that move and move. It's restful here. Peace. It's friendly. And you're very close to finding what you're looking for. You'll find them soon now. The guilty ones. When you're rested. Gentle waters closing over you. Steady. Deep. Drawing you down, down, down.
Here he is, Professor Moriarty. Stand up, Mr. Holmes. Open your eyes. Face this way. Are you satisfied? We are dealing with a clever man. He may be shamming. There's just one infallible test for profound hypnosis. You ready, Dr. Simnel? That will do, Doctor. He couldn't fake insensibility to the knife. I congratulate you, Lydia. Turn round, Mr. Holmes. Now walk to the desk. Sit down. Take that pen and write what I tell you to write. I have at last found a case which I cannot solve. I have outlived my usefulness. Therefore, I have decided to end my life. Sign your name. Now blot it. Fold it up. And put it in your pocket. Come, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Go out onto the terrace. But it won't look like suicide, sir. I'm sorry, but Mr. Holmes' injuries must all be self-inflicted. Let's walk a little, Mr. Holmes. It's so pleasant here in the garden. Just step up here onto the terrace. It's a nice, broad terrace. Now turn to the left and walk slowly to the end of the terrace. Don't stop. You must walk to the end, you know. The end leads to an open doorway. You can pass through it in perfect safety. In the room beyond the doorway, you'll find what you've been looking for. Must you drag this on? This is the moment I've been anticipating for a long time, my dear. Go on, Mr. Holmes. Through the open doorway, you will find the man responsible for the finger murders and the death of Sir George Fenning. Professor Moriarty. Holmes! Stand still! What a beautiful view, Watson. I'm quite enjoying it. No, you're not. You're hypnotized. You're under a spell. Stand still. Don't move. Steady, Holmes. Steady, does it? Stand perfectly still where you are. Nonsense, Watson. Uh, you don't know what you're doing. Of course I know what I'm doing. You mean you're not hypnotized? Certainly not. Then get off the wall, you idiot. Oh, oh, look out! Holmes! Oh, oh. Dear what were you doing out there? Holding the fort until you arrived. What kept you? Well, I ran into a spot of trouble on my way to Scotland Yard. I was arrested for exceeding the speed limit. Your luck seems to hold, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'd hardly call it luck, Professor. You see, I substituted a drug of my own for the one that this dear lady pressed on me. You are clever, aren't you? A drug that, um, although it leaves the subject conscious, renders him quite insensitive to pain. That accounted for my lack of reaction to Dr. Simnel's knife. Well, Gregson, quite an impressive haul. Even Inspector Lestrade himself couldn't have done any better. Thanks, Mr. Holmes. Take him away. All right, put her in the van. I was right, Mr. Holmes. You are a difficult subject. Thank you. And now, Professor, our score is settled. Au revoir until I see you on the gallows. The rope has not been made that will go around my neck. Come on.
I'll take care of things, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Inspector. Come on. An evil man, Holmes, but what a horrible death. Better than he deserved. What are you thinking of? I'm thinking of all the women who can come and go in safety in the streets of London tonight. The stars keep watching their heavens. And in our own little way, we too, old friend, are privileged to watch over our city. <laughs> 